Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the MDOTS Center. Uh, today's webinar is a deep dive into designing and implementing reinforcement learning algorithms to drive personalized adaptive behavioral interventions. Our speaker is Anna Trella, a PhD student working with professors Finale Doshi and Murphy at Harvard University. Their labs are doing cutting edge work on reinforcement learning based mechanisms to personalize behavioral interventions in terms of timing, frequency, and preferred type. So uh, with uh, that brief background, let me uh, invite our terrific Anna Trella to the webinar. Thank you, Professor Shetty. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'll begin my talk now. So thank you everyone for being here today. I really appreciate y'all taking the time out of your day. And today I will be talking about how to design your reinforcement learning or RL algorithm for mobile health studies. Just sharing a little bit about me. I'm currently a third year computer science PhD candidate at Harvard University. I have the incredible pleasure to be advised by Susan Murphy and Finale Doshi Velez. And before coming to Harvard, I studied applied mathematics at UC Berkeley. And also uh, before entering a PhD program, I was also a technical lead and software development engineer at Amazon. I had the privilege to also work with many amazing people and lots of exciting customer facing projects. Just wanted to share a few of my favorites that I feel give me, um, you know, uh, to showcase like how I, I learned a lot during there and I'm uh, really proud of what we accomplished. And some examples are, um, I worked on the dynamic global groceries ingress for desktop and mobile. And I also worked on the brand specific mobile app grocery shopping experience for Fresh and Whole Foods. And I also built the mobile app cart for Amazon luxury brands. And I, again, I'm just very grateful to have all this, um, to be able to work on these products. And I feel that that really shapes um, a lot of the research trajectories that um, I'm taking currently today. And now moving to present day, I also have the incredible privilege to be working on Oralytics. So Oralytics is a mobile health application that uses a reinforcement learning or RL algorithm to select the timeliness of motivational messages and feedback to improve users' oral self-care behaviors. And Oralytics will go into the field in spring 2023. Just wanted to highlight some of the folks that I get to work with on the Oralytics team. Uh, we are a very interdisciplinary team, uh, for all the way from behavioral health to um, clinicians, web developers, backend developers, app developers, uh, statistics, and of course, um, the folks at Harvard that I work with in my lab. Okay, so now that uh, we kind of have an idea and some background, uh, I have an agenda for today. I'll talk about the motivation of Oralytics, and then I'll offer some background on reinforcement learning. And then I will chat about why we need to thoughtfully design the RL algorithm. And then I'll also talk about two very interesting research questions that arose from designing the RL algorithm specifically or for Oralytics. And what was really exciting is that as we were de developing the RL algorithm for Oralytics, we were able to answer these two scientific or research questions and develop uh, two papers. So one is designing the algorithm through using a generalizable framework, and we created that framework. And the second is designing an algorithm through modifying a already well-studied, well-known algorithm. So uh, some dental health facts. So did you know that $108 billion uh, was spent annually on dental health services in the US uh, from a CDC report? And shockingly, 95% of that is in treating the consequences of oral disease, while less than 5% of that was actually on oral health promotion and disease prevention. Uh, another statistic is that 33% of men brush only once a day and 59% of women regularly skip brushing at bedtime. And this is in a 2009 UK report. 
And in that report, we also saw that dental disease is linked to poor oral hygiene behaviors. Okay, so I hope I didn't scare you, but as we can see, um, dental disease is a prominent issue, um, but it is preventable through the systematic twice a day toothbrushing. Unfortunately, as we saw, this basic behavior is not as widely practiced because patients forget or abandon clinician instructions. And so that's the main motivation for our oralytic study is that um, we are aiming to, let's say, have like N study users or patients. And for each user, for a morning decision time or evening decision time before their morning or evening brushing, what we call brushing window before they brush, we want the RL algorithm to personalize feedback and encouraging messages to the user in their setting around the time when they brush their teeth but also without burdening them. And this RL algorithm will be informed from user brushing data collected from the Bluetooth toothbrush. So folks might be asking, well, why use an RL algorithm? Well, RL algorithms can offer engaging feedback and motivational messages to individuals in their home settings or in settings closer to when they brush their teeth. So ultimately, oral health depends on the individual's ability and willingness to actually carry out the consistent brushing behavior. And as innovation in healthcare works to move from focusing on very costly reactive care for established diseases to proactive preventative care, there is this increasing importance on promoting self-care. And so we see this as an opportunity to supplement the episodic clinician-delivered oral hygiene instruction with being able to leverage technologies and deliver these engaging feedback and motivational messages to individuals around the time that they brush their teeth. And this delivery is not manual, it is algorithmic, and it supports these healthy brushing behaviors. A second reason is that the algorithm will be able to learn through data and also bias these micro-randomized probabilities. So what do I mean by that? Well, the RL algorithm, as it collects data, it will learn. And as it learns at each decision time, so before the user brushes their teeth, it will um, increase the probability for contexts or settings where the data indicates that sending a message will increase user brushing or that sending a message will be beneficial. In addition, it will also decrease the probability of sending a message for contexts or settings at which it learned that the data um, indicates that the message will be less effective. And this is increasingly important in order to avoid burdening or annoying the user. So now I will go through the basics of an RL algorithm. So the reinforcement learning framework each problem is uniquely defined by a state action and reward space. So the state features or their setting or context is the user's current context. And actions are what actions the RL algorithm will choose from at decision time. In our case, the action is either send a message or don't send a message. And the reward is then used to give feedback to the algorithm to tell it that it chose an optimal action for the current context. And I wanted to note here the example of brushing quality. Um, and usually the reward is chosen to be a proximal outcome for my behavioral health folks, which is a short-term goal, such as brushing quality. Um, and that is differentiated by the distal outcome, such as long-term dental health. And so oftentimes the reward is chosen to be that short-term goal in order to provide timely feedback to the algorithm so that is able to learn. And so the goal of any RL algorithm is to optimally select actions in order to maximize the reward we define. Okay. And so it does this by first at each decision time. So in this case, uh, morning and evening before users brushing window, we follow an action selection procedure. And this action selection procedure is just a function that takes in the current state or setting and gives uh, an action. Right, the action that we are going to take at that decision time. And so we want to be able to tailor these actions based off of state variables or the user's current state and also historical information that we've learned through the data. 
And so in order to have a quality action selection procedure, we also have a second component, which is the model of user environment. And so this is how we model user behavior. And so this model of user behavior, if we're able to learn from the data against the state features or the context at which actions sending a message or not sending a message is beneficial for the user in increasing the reward or brushing quality, then we can use that good quality model to then inform our action selection procedure and select actions uh, in order to help the user maximize their brushing. So using these two components at decision time, the RL algorithm selects and executes an action and observes a reward. So in the example of Oralytics, let's say the well, for one user, their current state is it's the morning decision time. Maybe they brush 30 seconds on average uh, the day before. And if we follow the action selection procedure of our RL algorithm, it will tell us to send a message. And the user or patient might get some uh, no push notification, for example, like the one shown in the slide here, like learn how to brush to improve your teeth, click to view. And then after we have selected an, or the RL algorithm has selected an action, we will then observe a reward. In this case, it's brushing quality. So that was decision time. That's how the RL algorithm makes decisions. But again, the RL algorithm also learns. So at update times, the RL algorithm will update both the model of the user and also uh, therefore will inform the update for the action selection procedure. So now that we have some RL basics down, here is an overview of the RL design deployment and after study pipeline. So step one is before we deploy the RL algorithm for our mobile health study, we have a thorough design and evaluation process. Usually we design the RL algorithm with consideration of domain experts and thorough discussions with the scientific team. And we would evaluate the RL algorithm using a simulation test bed. After we've thoroughly designed and evaluated the algorithm, we set it up for deployment. We set up this, both the software and hardware ready for, to deploy the algorithm. And we want the RL algorithm to deploy and run stably under possible real world constraints or challenges. And finally, after the study, we have data collected from the RL algorithm, and we may want to use that data to perform some sort of statistical inference in order to inform the design of following studies. So why do we need such a thorough and thoughtful design and evaluation process? Well, suppose you wanted to design an online RL algorithm for your real-world study. It can be extremely costly to run such a study. Unlike certain areas of RL, such as games and robotics, when the study, especially is a pre-registered clinical trial, as we know, once initiated, the trial protocol, which includes the RL algorithm, cannot be altered without jeopardizing trial validity. And this is an example of a one-way door decision. Namely, once we commit to a set of design decisions, you step through the door, the door closes, and the decisions you make are irreversible for the duration of the trial. So in order to prevent poor design decisions that could be detrimental to both the user effectiveness and to study results, uh, RL algorithms for these real-world problems must undergo a thorough design and testing process before deployment. So like I prefaced earlier, um, some interesting questions arose from designing and evaluating and developing the algorithm for the Oralytic study. The first question is, how do we design an algorithm that gives confidence to the scientific team? So what properties of the algorithm makes the scientific team confident in deployment? And what does confidence even mean to such a team? The second question that we were exploring is, you know, sometimes we have an algorithm that is well studied, but it may be constrained or made simple to run in the real world. So how do we modify these algorithms to still uh, generalize and obtain the properties that we want? So for example, in mobile health studies, we are very interested in preventing user burden. And some algorithms are well studied and exist, but they don't account for user burden. Um, i.e. they don't consider the current messages or interventions impact on how a user responds to future messages. So how do we modify a well-studied existing algorithm in order to prevent user burden? 
And that leads us to the two research questions or contributions that we were developing, which is first, we developed a framework for algorithm design. So how to design your RL algorithm from scratch with desirable properties that will give you confidence in deployment. And second, if you have an already existing algorithm that is well studied and that you really love to use, well, we have some procedures for modifying the existing algorithm, namely through reward design, that could help your algorithm generalize and prevent user burden. So now I will talk about our first contribution, which is our PCS framework for reinforcement learning, which helps you design your RL algorithm for digital interventions. The PCS framework, um, again, in order to address these challenges, provides to the general community an exposition of both the practical and potential theoretical challenges that could arise when developing RL algorithms for these digital intervention settings. And in order to design a quality algorithm, we should know what properties that we want to achieve. And so this framework defines three pillars or properties of a quality RL algorithm. Namely, P stands for personalization. We want to personalize and learn. Uh, we want to personalize decisions uh, for each user very well. C, which is computability. We want the RL algorithm to comp uh, be computable under real world constraints and be able to actually run um, within the constraints of the study. And third, S stands for stability, which means we want the RL algorithm to run stably across possible challenging environments without a human in the loop process, without constantly debugging or intervening into the um, in the fixing or modifying the RL algorithm. So um, this framework incorporates these best practices, and I know um, some folks might already see similarities of best practices already implemented in their own regimes. Uh, but there currently, before our paper, did not exist such a generalizable framework. So let's go through each pillar. The first uh, is P, again, it's personalization. And recall the main goal of running our RL algorithm in our study is we want to learn opportune times to deliver these messages in order to improve users' brushing quality throughout the study. And if we translate this into something that the RL algorithm can understand, the goal really is personalization, which is we want to learn to select actions in order to maximize each user's average reward. And if we do that, then we say that we have personalized to each user. And so our paper also offers multiple metrics to capture and measure personalization because there's many different priorities for personalization in different settings. And these span multiple categories of personalization. Some examples include one, a global performance metric. So we suggest looking at average of users, average across time rewards. And this gives a global perspective of the performance of the algorithm on average across users. The second is a risk metric or a risk assessment, and we uh, suggest looking at the 25th percentile of users average across time rewards. And this risk assessment measures, um, you know, it measures maybe how well did the RL algorithm do for users that may not have benefited as much. And finally, the third example we show is the performance over time metric. So we look at average reward across time and users, but for multiple time steps. And so maybe certain algorithms may learn faster than other algorithms. So we also care about maybe how fast they learn or uh, which time steps, um, you know, how, uh, which time step did they learn um, the fastest compared to other algorithms. Okay, so that was uh, the personalization principle. Now let's look at C. C stands for computability or constraints. And this uh, is all issues related to ensuring that the RL algorithm can select actions and update in a timely manner while running online. So for example, there are often constraints on the RL algorithm in terms of obtaining data in real time or timely access to data. Maybe we have some after study analyses that we wanna run such as off policy evaluation or causal inference concerns. And finally, of course, we're running this algorithm in real life. So there's budgetary constraints specifically on the software engineering development. So one example for Oralytics is timely access to data. So the research team's first choice of a reward was a measure of brushing quality actually derived from using quadrant sensor data. 
And this is because we believe brushing quality should incorporate even or balanced brushing across all quadrants. However, the brushing quality outcome um, would not be readily attainable using our current hardware because in order to obtain that data, the toothbrush dock must be plugged in and have reliable Bluetooth connectivity, and the user must be standing within a few feet of the toothbrush dock while brushing their teeth. Um, you can see that um, many times a user may fail to meet these two requirements for a variety of reasons. One example is maybe the user is uh, brushes their teeth in a shared bathroom where they cannot uh, conveniently leave the dock plugged in. And so thus we selected brushing duration in seconds as one of the components for um, measuring up or defining brushing quality because this is also an indicator of um, good brushing. And also this piece of data is readily available as long, uh, yeah, even when the user um, does not fit those, uh, the two criteria I described earlier. Another example of a constraint is after, after study analyses. So we, um, so again, like I said before, we want to perform some sort of maybe hypothesis testing or after study analyses using the data collected from the RL algorithm. And so because of these concerns, we decided that one, the RL algorithm should select actions probabilistically, so not deterministically. And second, these probabilities should be bounded away from zero and one. And the reason why we do these two things is because it enhances the ability of investigators to use the resulting data to address scientific questions with sufficient power after the study is done. So specifically for oralytics, we've clipped the action selection probabilities between 0.2 and 0.8. And this probability is um, the probability of the algorithm to select action one or select to send a message for that decision time. And again, the third example is a limited engineering budget. So as you can see uh, for the Murphy Lab Reinforcement Learning Software Engineering team, uh, to develop such an RL algorithm, it takes a whole software development team to build a production ready algorithm from data collection, cleaning, testing, QA testing, deployment, um, building the infrastructure to support such a system, having the ML researchers make sure the RL algorithm is sound, each role is integral to the whole deployment pipeline. And so your expectation might be having this whole team, uh, but in reality, you might only have one PhD student. Um, and I call this the best buy one, get six free deal. Okay, so that was C, uh, computability. And now let's look at S, stability. So stability serves two purposes. One, the stability principle says the RL algorithm must run stably and automatically without the need for constant human monitoring and adjustment. And second, the RL algorithm should also be robust to or perform well across a variety of potential real world environments. And in doing so, we also advocate and teach folks how to build a simulation environment that each encompasses a plausible real world challenge. So some examples that we believe the oralytic study um, or some properties that might describe the real world environment that oralytics will run in is user heterogeneity. We believe our users will be very different. They will, um, their baseline uh, might be very different and they might, uh, or they might respond very differently to treatment. Second is non-stationarity, which is the outcome brushing quality might appear to change over time. And the third example that I'm going to give is we have, we're in a high noise environment. And so the outcomes might be very, very noisy. And this just means that we might think that um, uh, outcome is due to our own action or message or intervention, but it really was because of something that we didn't observe or because of noise. And so our framework advocates for first in green, as you can see, designing multiple RL algorithm candidates that have different design decisions that you want to make for each algorithm. And these you can think of as you know, competitors in um, a sport. And each in yellow, you have each environment variant. Again, each environment variant encapsulates a possible real world challenge, such as user heterogeneity or high noise environment. And you can think of each of these environments as an event that an athlete has to compete in. And so for each event or environment, we have all of the algorithms or competitors compete 
and we evaluate them ba uh, based off of the personality metric we chose earlier. And so you have this nice kind of like grid where for each environment, you can see the algorithm that won that um, environment or won that event. And then you can have this global idea of which RL, RL algorithm uh, did well for each environment. And the RL algorithm we finally choose uh, will perform well, ideally, um, across all these environments. So that was the PCS framework. Our framework, again, is generalizable and offers designers a rigorous principled approach to designing, evaluating, and confidently deploying their RL algorithm. And so theoretical RL algorithms have shown promising results in theory or artificial domains, um, but unfortunately, sometimes they make some unrealistic assumptions that just don't apply in our real world setting. So our, our, our framework can be seen as a way of bridging theory with the feasibility of designing an RL algorithm for a real life mobile health study. So that was the first interesting research question, as well as our contribution, which is a framework for designing RL algorithms. I will now move into the second research question and our second contribution, which is our um, how we modify um, a very beloved algorithm through reward design. So giving folks some background, the most commonly used RL algorithm in mobile health interventions are bandit algorithms, one of the simplest types of RL algorithms. Bandit algorithms are commonly used because of their ability to run reliably and stably in an online environment, which is especially critical for high stakes clinical trial settings. And these mobile health clinical trials can require years of work by an interdisciplinary team to develop and gather funding for. And so again, the RL algorithm cannot be trivially changed once the study begins. So it is critical that the RL algorithm runs stably and bandit algorithms are very stable. And that could be one reason why folks um, are, uh, bandit algorithms are very commonly used in mobile health studies, even over some fancier algorithm. However, bandit algorithms are not designed to um, account for delayed effects of actions. Classic bandit algorithms are designed to optimize the immediate reward, and they do not account for delayed effects of actions or the impact of the current action on a user's responsive responsivity to future um, actions. So why is this important to consider? Why do we want to consider the current impact of sending a message on a user? Well. As we can all see, um, inappropriate, which I mean too many or untimely notification interruptions, can cause user burden, which can annoy users and cause them to become unresponsive. And this is, preventing user burden is crucial, especially in our mobile health setting, which typically have high user dropout rates. However, MDP-based algorithms are a type of algorithm that does consider how the current action impacts the next state and also future rewards. And so one option is to use an RL algorithm that is MDP based, and these algorithms will be able to model how the action, the current action impacts um, the future user's future responsivity, um, which it will model the impact of the next state and also future rewards achievable when starting in that next state. So then you probably are asking, that's great. Um, then your problem is solved. Uh, why not just replace your uh, bandit algorithm with a complex algorithm or even make the state space more complex? Uh, unfortunately, we cannot do that because going back to the computability principle of our framework, we are in a heavily constrained setting in Oralytics. Specifically, some um, two of the biggest constraints are highly noisy outcomes and also limited data per user. Because the MDP-based algorithm has more parameters to learn, it's more complex, we do not expect to have enough data per user to effectively learn the large number of parameters needed for many of these complex algorithms. And moreover, these algorithms may not be as stable to run and update online as bandit algorithms. They might need to use approximation methods or MCMC methods, and there's no um, nice closed form uh, stable update. And of course, most importantly, remember you only have one PhD student. So traditionally, um, or this motivates why we want to use reward design. 
Our goal is to modify or generalize the beloved bandit framework in order to um, in order to consider the delayed effects of these current actions, which will then prevent user burden. And so original or classical bandit algorithms, they use the same behavioral outcome as both the true target and reward. So I wanted to differentiate and define these two terms for you. The true target is what we truly care about. It's the behavioral health outcome that we're actually uh, that we actually care about, and we use this to evaluate the RL algorithm. The algorithm reward, on the other hand, is what we use to teach and give feedback to the algorithm. And so in classical bandit algorithms, these two terms or these two rewards or true targets, they have the same, um, they have the same, um, I guess, we define them to be the same, which in our example would be brushing quality, right? We give that brushing quality to feedback to the algorithm to learn, and we also evaluate the RL algorithm using how well did they maximize each user's brushing quality. But our solution is to modify the bandit algorithm by, um, by defining a different algorithm reward, and we call this a surrogate reward. So this is an idea borrowed from optimal reward problem and also the model predictive control literature, where instead of defining the algorithm reward to be equal to the behavioral outcome, we actually design a surrogate reward that, um, that is a modified version of the true target, but we still continue to evaluate the algorithm using the true target. And so in this case, we designed the surrogate reward to be brushing quality penalized by the cost of sending a message. And this way, we can keep our simple and beloved bandit algorithm while also preventing user burden. Um, and I'm also happy to chat more about this, um, the theoretical or the math part of um, why this is the case. Um, but for folks who are familiar with sort of the RL theory and Bellman equations, this cost term can actually be viewed as a crude proxy for the delayed effect of actions in the Bellman equations in an MDP environment. So uh, warning, there's going to be some math involved. So I will show you the surrogate reward and let's go deep into the surrogate reward design for Oralytics. So again, QIT is the current brushing quality for user I at decision time T. Again, this is our true target, which is our behavioral desired behavioral health outcome. And the surrogate reward at time T for user I is defined to be the brushing quality, user's brushing quality, minus some sort of cost of sending a message. And CIT, the cost of sending a message for user I at decision time T, is defined um, as follows. So the cost term, so we only penalize the reward if we choose to send a message at currently. Otherwise, we do not penalize the reward. But if we do choose to penalize the reward, um, I have in blue, I will translate what this, um, the interpretation of this equation. So this just means that if the user is a good brusher and we've bothered them too much, then penalize the cost or, pen or penalize the reward or assign a, uh, a cost to it um, with value XZ1. Or regardless of user performance, if we've bothered them too much, then also penalize the reward with value XZ2. So using our surrogate reward design, we ran some experiments. So here are the experiment results which is for each giant grid square that you can see, that represents an experiment run using our simulation environment test bed. So we ran 100 simulations for each small, small square in this big grid. And you can see the x-axis, um, the x and y-axis represent values of parameters that we chose for the parameters of the cost term and the for the reward definition. So xi is plant, uh, or xz1 is um, plotted on the x-axis and xz2 is plotted on the y-axis. And the first column in blue represents our, the metric that we cared about, which is average reward. And the second column in pink plots the lower 25th percentile reward. So uh, both columns have different metrics. And here, darker values means higher metric value. So higher, it, darker values are better than lighter values and in these uh, graphs. So what is the main takeaway? Well, our main takeaway, our experiments show 
that using the surrogate reward, which is our method, is better than using the true target reward, which is the original bandit algorithm. And you can see that the original bandit algorithm does not penalize rewards. And so that is equivalent to assigning value xe1 equals zero and xe2 equals zero, which is the bottom left hand corner grid. So our results, again, show in these graphs that any amount of inclusion of the cost term of any non-zero value is better than the original um, bandit algorithm. So our reward design gives other research teams an example of how to prevent user burden while still maintaining the, their commonly used well-studied RL algorithm. And so by designing a surrogate reward to include a cost term, instead of having the RL algorithm use the true target as a reward, we can generalize our contextual bandit framework to deal with the key challenge of capturing negative delayed effects of actions. So those were our two contributions, but using um, both of our methods, both the algorithm design and the reward design, you too can implement an RL algorithm for your mobile health application. Um, we used Auralytics as a case study, but some examples can also include mental health apps, anti-sedentary um, reminders, or even reminders to take medication. And so uh, using our two contributions, uh, you get an RL algorithm, uh, you also get an RL algorithm, everybody gets a quality RL algorithm. Okay. So that's it for me, but I wanted to take the time to say a huge thank you to the Oralytics team, uh, Professor Shetty, our project manager Zara, um, on the development side, software development side, we also have Hayek and Andrew, our mobile app developer Cody, our behavioral scientist, Billy, um, folks at Harvard that I work with, Kelly, and again, my adv two advisors, Professor Murphy and Professor Doshi Velez, um, Stephanie and Dennis, I really appreciate everyone. Um, this is a huge team effort and I've had the incredible privilege of working with these folks for two and a half years. And it's honestly been really, really fun and exhilarating and I've learned a lot. And so I really appreciate this opportunity and um, the opportunity to work with these folks and also share our uh, progress with you all. And I also want to acknowledge that this presentation and the Oralytics project was made possible with funding from NIDCR NIH grant UH3DE028723. Uh, so thank you. And here's my contact information, as well as QR codes for both papers and also my personal website. Um, both papers come with open source code, a readme on GitHub, and also the data is publicly available as well. And if you have any other questions or feedback, please do not hesitate to reach out to uh, the Murphy Lab Reinforcement Learning Software Engineering team. Thank you. Wonderful, Anna. Thank you. Uh, very nice summary. I, I open it up to the audience. Uh, raise your hand and uh, Anna will take your questions. Oh, I uh, uh, Yeah, great presentation. Yeah, uh, I would like to know what motivated because uh, this RL algorithm, like I have seen it uh, being used in a lot of uh, uh, like logistic or other as well as uh, high level. But what motivated you to get into uh, the brushing? Thank you. Um, sorry, I wasn't really able to hear the last sentence that you said. Could you please repeat the last sentence? Oh, yeah. My just qu uh, question is like, what motivated you to have this Arial algorithm to be implemented in brushing? Uh, I, I, I can actually answer that. Uh, oh, yeah, Anna was the, uh, uh, it is a very interesting <laughs> application because unlike other behaviors, uh, this is a habit, except it's not done, uh, it's done daily, but it's not done efficiently. And uh, Anna was introduced it 
to we, we got Anna on board because we got uh, the notion of getting six for one was too much to pass up on. So uh, Anna, that's Anna's graduate work. So Anna, up to you now to explain what are the exciting features about the brushing paradigm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Shetty, for that summary. Um, yeah, this is part of my graduate work, and I'm more interested in like designing RL algorithms for a variety of problems. But I think specifically for brushing, like I mentioned in the motivational slides, um, th this seems like a huge gap that we can fill just by motivating or sending feedback to users, which is um, there. It's very low, uh, low cost because um, you know, there's not real, unlike other areas of the medical field where there might be um, like hesitancy in deploying a real world um, algorithm for maybe more riskier settings like ICU. Um, this is very risk adverse, right? And it's a very simple nudge that we can implement that has high impact. Like we, if we can get users this, or if we can provide users this sort of like um, preventative, um, you know, health regime in order to help them brush their teeth. I know that seems like a simple everyday task, but if folks are able to actually implement this habit, then the the positive consequences we believe can be huge, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, from uh, yeah, now I remember, like you, ha you had mentioned earlier in the slide, like there are only 5% of that, uh, the dental health care, right? So, so with this, I think, yeah, definitely it will, help increase uh, that 5% to go up than just the, uh, what is that uh, servicing just after they have the sickness. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you again for your question. Dennis? <clears throat> yeah, hi, Anna. Um, so maybe very simply put, what, what your reinforcement learning algorithm does is it tries to figure out the user, that is, what types of messages work best for a given user. Um, and that is what, what is being optimized. But there's a second reinforcement learning process going on and that happens in the user. So in, in other words, the user isn't, isn't stationary, but he or she may learn, change their, their behavior which you know, actually you would think is, is the ultimate goal. Um, the ultimate goal is not to understand the user, but to change the user behavior. So my question is, um, and I think you alluded to it a little bit, but I'm still a bit unclear. How do you deal with the fact that um, a user just may change due to learning processes that go on uh, within a user? Yeah, that's a really great question, Dennis. Thank you. Um, I will say uh, our RL algorithm does not specifically consider that. However, our RL algorithm that we design, we want it to be generalizable or robust to certain challenges like that. And I see like non-stationarity or what you described, like the user's behavior changing over time, that we can model using the user environment. Or that is a challenge that we can encode in our simulation environment where the users is non-stationary or appears to their outcomes appear to be non-stationary. And so although we do not, we we can't specifically um, detail like every possible challenge and incorporate into the RL algorithm, what we can do is design an algorithm to be as general as possible and test it robustly using these the simulation environment and a challenge like you just described can be one of the variants of the simulation environment so recall on one of the slides i gave the analogy of like an rl algorithm as a competitor or an athlete competing in many different events this could definitely be one of the events or the variants that we consider does that answer your question uh yeah um it 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 does yes thank you it's i'm thinking the way things are set up what would you expect if you take away um the messages at the end of the study you know um because i think that's that's an issue that you the you, you may encounter with nudges and yeah? nudges are, are are good as long as they are there but once you take them away um, 
the the user just goes back to, to, to previous behavior. And he or she would if there was no change in the behavior of the user at all, right? So there's a difference in in um, finding the best nudge that works that works best for a user and actually changing the user's behavior. So I guess my question is, wouldn't an, uh, the goal of an, of an algor algorithm, a reinforcement learning algorithm, wouldn't it have to be not just finding the best nudge, but also changing the user's behavior? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's definitely a really awesome desert errata that we can definitely consider. Um, but I definitely think that this would need more consideration with our interdisciplinary team, namely our behavioral scientists who can maybe offer us some sort of like more expertise in this area, like how well does a user um, develop a habit even when you remove the nudges? Um, and I also wanted to, um, I guess, describe more about the interventions. So although the RL algorithm decides between sending a message and not sending a message, which is binary, we do have a more complex procedure for selecting the specific message prompt. And so that procedure, the RL algorithm does not choose specifically which prompt. The RL algorithm, again, only chooses message or no message, but then we have a more complicated randomization procedure for a variety of different prompts that the user might get. So it's very unlikely that a user will get um, the same prompt twice. And there's also different categories of messages a user could get um, for example, a feedback message or a Q&A message to keep the user engaged. But I definitely agree with you. I think that's definitely a very interesting question that we can ask. And we can definitely think about how maybe to incorporate that into our RL algorithm or the future, I guess, long-term um, impact of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Zion. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh... Thanks, Anna, for the great talk. Uh, can you go back to uh, slide 56? Okay. I guess the question is, do you want, can you share more insights on why this is the case that when you use the circuit award, reward, it works better? Is, that, is this because you were operating on the simulation data or is this is there like something fundamental about this regime of using target reward? Yeah, that's a great like question. Yeah, and thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so let's dig deeper into that. So without looking at math or even these graphs anymore, um, let's just think about it, which is there's not really um, there's not really a negative impact currently for sending a user a message, right? We don't really believe that a user will purposely brush less or refuse to brush because they got a message. And so the, the nuance is there's no negative of there's no current negative effect for choosing to send a message. The only negative effect is delayed, right? The only negative or penalty we incur or cost that we incur for sending a message currently is we compromise user responsivity to future messages, right? Burdening the user. And so, like you said, like our simulation test bed, we did build it using real data. And if you want to learn more about that, please look at the appendix of our paper. But we go through every detail that um, we made um, in making the simulation environment. It is made using real users brushing data. But we, in order to make the simulation environment more complex, in order to make it sort of model these real user burden behaviors, what we did is we have the simulation environment um, simulate a user, and if the user was sent too many messages, then they will um, habituate or their effect size for the true effect size in the reward generating environment will go down. So we do in that simulation environment simulate burdened users. And so again, maybe some insight on why our method beats the original bandit algorithm is because the bandit algorithm does not learn the delayed effect, right? It only maximizes the immediate reward. And so it doesn't take into consideration the future effect, de negative delayed effects of the sending a message. 
but our bandit algorithm, our modified algorithm with reward design does in that it penalizes the reward if it believes the user could be burdened. And this cost term, again, can be seen as a very crude proxy for um, like the delayed effects of the current action. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mason, you have a question. Hi, right, thanks, Anna. Uh, great talk, um, University of Michigan here. I really like the framework you talked about. I think it was, uh, was it PCS or PSC uh, evaluating L RL algorithm. Mm -hmm. One thing, could you talk about maybe post-study inference? Um, mm -hmm. Because I think you mentioned that, well, kind of two questions, that there's action clipping going on when assigning whether a person receives a message or not. Mm -hmm. So is that gonna, be included in the final rollout of the algorithm policy, or is that only for the research studies so you can do post-study inference? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know we are definitely doing clipped action selection probabilities for both the pilot study and the real study. In terms of um, the longevity of continuing to use this app, definitely think we would have to chat about that and with the whole research team chat about the priorities. Um, and also, again, uh, there's no free lunch, right? Everything is a trade-off. Um, and so in the reason why we just don't always do action selection probabilities or click, uh, clipping is um, there's this sort of trade-off between uh, maximizing reward and also um, having enough data or having enough data that we can answer these scientific questions with sufficient power. And so we're definitely very aware of this trade-off and we'll definitely like, chat about it more for, um, you know, if we're going to clip the probabilities for um, even after the study. Uh, any other questions, Mason? Uh, not, I'll, uh, Alexander. Uh, yeah, uh, one question. So this surrogate reward thing makes me think a little bit of surrogate biomarkers. Um, do any of the same? I'm actually not super familiar with surrogate biomarkers, but I, I, I've seen them around. Um, do any of the same issues come up? So I'll be honest, I don't, I've never heard of surrogate biomarkers. Would you maybe? Um, sure. So yeah. you, you, you might have, say, uh two biomarkers right one is easy to measure or cheap to measure and one is expensive to measure but is really the biomarker of interest right and you assume that they're highly correlated and so uh but you can't really measure the biomarker of interest that often and so you measure and model the surrogate instead and right. so it seems like a similar idea here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for explaining that. I definitely see a lot of similarities. Um, most, the biggest similarity is, again, um, the separate one where you said there's, a, instead of using the true desired biomarker, you use a surrogate. In this mm -hmm. case, we're less concerned about cost and, or, you know, like maybe it's more expensive to um, like measure. Uh, in this case, brushing quality, it is measurable. Um, in this case, we choose a surrogate reward um, because we want to be able to capture this sort of um, like delayed effective actions. Namely, mm -hmm. in incorporating this cost, it will allow us to generalize our original bandit algorithm, which again is very myopic. It only looks at the immediate reward to help mm -hmm. it actually approximate this sort of like the future um, or the delayed effect of on future rewards of the current action. And so you're entirely right. It, um, it sounds like there are a lot of similarities. And I think that's why we use the language surrogate because mm -hmm. oftentimes, right, in mobile health, we do care about the true behavioral outcome, right? We do care about that. But our paper shows that, um, you know, in our setting, in order to sort of deal with or combat this sort of like real world constraints or challenges, it might not be wise to set the algorithm reward to your true target, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, using the surrogate reward sort of deals with 
um, the real world challenges of user burden. Mm -hmm. Okay, one other question related to this. What it, so would these kind of surrogate rewards help in settings where say it is very different, like you have some reward that you can only measure it very infrequently? Because that would be kind of like the the surrogate an analogous to surrogate biomarker. Yeah, absolutely. So I I'm not too sure if our specific example would generalize, but mm -hmm. I definitely know that um, distal versus proximal outcomes um, or distal are, are is an open research problem, and we do have quite yeah. a few folks in our lab who are researching that. So I definitely think I can plug their work. I'd be happy to um, share more about that with y'all offline, but I don't work on that, but it is definitely a research area that we deeply care about, which is um, how do you properly run an algorithm when the rewards are sparse or you only um, you know, observe a distal outcome at the end of the study instead yeah. of these proximal rewards as um, a research area that our lab is focusing on. Great, thank well, you. Thank you, Anna, uh, for the terrific work you do, which will have broad application across health behavior change. I uh, also wanted to thank the audience for hanging on for this lecture. Uh, just a reminder that the lecture is uh, uh, taped and a curated version will be available on the MDOT uh, website. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.